couple of years back, someone came out with a book on Buddhism called The Intelligent Heart. Two words we don't normally put together. Intelligence is a factor of the mind, we think. But it makes an important point. You look in the Buddhist teachings, they don't seem to have a very clear delineation between the way we the way we do between heart and mind. The Thais have the word for heart and a word for mind, but they use them interchangeably. As if there were no radical difference between the two. And it's important that we learn to put the two together. But for us are two separate things. So that our heart is intelligent, our mind is sensitive. <laughs> To the issues of the heart. It's only when the two are in constant dialogue that we can re achieve a balance in our practice. And that balance is important. Otherwise we fall off to one side in which the meditation simply becomes a technical exercise. And you get proficient at it in the same way that a technician gets proficient at, say, at fixing a machine. reducing all of our issues of our heart and mind to the kind of mechanics, mechanics of perception, the mechanics of a technique that you can apply to the mind. And then there's the other side, where the meditation becomes more of an emotional thing. Like the quote we talked about today, sometimes it could seem like the whole purpose of this is to have a good cry and then feel better afterwards. The thing is, we've got to learn how to practice down the middle there, between those two attitudes. There is a technical aspect to the meditation, and there is a more emotional aspect. And the two have to be brought together for them to make any really good radical changes in the mind, radical changes in the heart. Theravada is often portrayed as a very dry and unemotional religion, but there's, there are emotions that lie at its heart. Sangwega basara. Sangwega is there to give us a sense of the enormousness of the project ahead of us. Basically what it comes down to is a sense of how meaningful our lives normally are, our, how petty our concerns are in face of the larger horror of aging, illness, and death. But if it stopped there, it would be very depressing. I mean, you look at aging, illness, and death. You go into old people's homes. You stay around people who are getting old and ill and losing their faculties, and you realize what a miserable way this is to end your life. We like to think a human life would have a sort of a nice rounded-off ending, but it doesn't. It just strays off into loose ends. The mind that used to be able to think clearly can't even form a clear concept at all. The body that used to be able to do good work lies around helpless. And if we don't die a slow death from old age, well, there are accidents that happen, diseases that knock us out. Many times in the midst of something, you're on your way to an important meeting, whoop, there you go, that's it. You're in the midst of a big project that means a lot to you, and suddenly the heart stops. And when you really stop to think about it, it begins, life begins to seem very meaningless, very arbitrary. And often we just sort of brush that aside and go on with our normal affairs. But when we do that, we limit ourselves. We put big blinders on our minds and desensitize ourselves to the big issue in life. What was remarkable about the Buddha was that he took on that issue, wanted to do something about it. And that's where the second emotion comes in, basada, conviction that there's a way out. In particular, the story that they say tell of the Buddha's decision to leave the forest, it was because he's, after seeing the old person and the ill person and the dead person. He then saw a forest contemplative, a wandering monk. 
and decided if there was a way out, it was that kind of life that was going to provide the way out. And with little more than that conviction, he left his home, he left his family, and went out into the forest. And it was that conviction that kept him going all the way through even when he found that the teachers of his time didn't have a real answer to his question and when severe asceticism didn't provide the answer. He didn't give up. He kept looking for something that would work. That conviction, that confidence, they, the word is also used to mean the clarity of water in a still lake, clean water in a still lake. So it's all of those connotations together, the clarity, the confidence, the conviction. That's the other side of the emotional life of a Buddhist meditation, Buddhist practice. So you take the two of them together, Sangwega, a sense of awe, a sense of urgency that something's got to be done about this. You can't just keep on living in your petty way. It's a big issue that we're facing here. And so our practice has to be a large practice as well. It can't just be a technique, and it can't just be some emotional catharsis. You've got to work down the middle between the two. If it's, we turn everything just into a technique, it turns into a type of attachment, what the Buddha called attachment to precepts and practices. It's one of the four forms of clinging that lead to suffering. And the commentaries often say, well, this refers to ceremonial practices, rituals in other religions. But when you look at the text, when the Buddha is talking about a particular practice that has to be abandoned for the mind to open up, it's the practice of jhana, which is actually part of the path. It's a good thing we have to do, but there comes you can't treat it simply as a particular technique that's going to get you there without your taking on the larger issues of your mind, larger issues of your heart. For that, you keep reminding yourself of the big issues, the aging, illness, and death, what lies in store for you. If you don't get your mind in good shape, you're really going to be in bad shape when those things begin to hit. You see the difference between people who've been practicing and those who haven't as death approached, as I said with a John Sawat. He commented to me the last time I saw him that his brain was sending him all sorts of strange messages, but he had the mindfulness to recognize them as strange messages. And as he also said, he said, but that thing that he got through his meditation, that hadn't changed. That was still there. Compare that to someone who hasn't been practicing as their mind begins to go. They see snakes in the dining room, dogs in the living room, evil people out in the property. Belief can. 100% that their perceptions must be true. All sorts of things can haunt the mind of a person who hasn't trained the mind, hasn't learned to look at its thoughts simply as an observer without getting tied up in them, hasn't learned to look at its emotions without getting tied up in them. So the technical part of the practice is there to serve the larger issue. of being able to negotiate aging, illness, and death, and not suffer. So try to keep both of these dimensions in mind, both the dimension of the heart, as we conceive it as something separate, and the dimension of the mind. Learn how to bring them together so your heart does become an intelligent heart. Learning when to interfere with what's going on in the mind and when to simply watch. If you can't figure out anything, we'll just be very patient. Learn to have the patience of just sitting there and watching what's going on until you begin to notice something that gives you a handle on the situation. We have the technique of the breath. We have the technique of dealing with the breath, and that can give you a foundation. But just that simple technique is not going to take care of everything. You have to use your own powers of observation. And keep your gaze broad. So it encompasses both the mind and the heart in a singular field of vision. 
so that the meditation doesn't veer off into simple technicalities and it doesn't veer off into mere emotionalism. The emotional side has to be there, and the active side of the mind analyzing thing has to be there as well. And it's important that we learn to bring the two of them together so that this heart-mind of ours does come back together. And the breadth of that vision and the more all-inclusiveness of the vision is what, is what leads to real wisdom, real discernment. So you see where you're pacing, placing your hopes for happiness. And you can gauge whether this is something that's intelligent or not. Several weeks back, the, I was teaching Laguna Beach. Some, we raised the issue of the Buddhist teaching is basically teaching on how to find true happiness. And that there are gradations. Some forms of happiness were wiser than others. And someone who was very new to the practice immediately objected. How can anyone dare pass judgment on what he finds as happiness? That was his objection. And in a world where actions didn't have consequences, and no one would have a right to pass judgment in any ways. And even in a world where people do actions do have consequences, it's not the question that we're passing judgment to make you feel bad, make a person feel bad, but simply to say there may be something better, maybe some wiser way of looking for happiness, a more intelligent way of looking for happiness. It means bringing the heart and the mind together, working together on this project, rather than simply demanding on the independence of the heart, I'm going to find happiness where I want to find it and nobody can tell me any better. That attitude goes nowhere. People can simply get stuck in their ways. End of discussion. And yet they still go ahead and they suffer. So the Buddha's purpose is not to pass judgment on people, but to say, look, you're causing yourself suffering. And it's a big issue, and you don't know how much suffering that's going to be. But here's a way out. It involves developing qualities that we tend to associate with the mind. Mindfulness, alertness, clarity. Also qualities associated with the heart. Compassion, goodwill, sympathetic joy. Sangwega. That sense of awe, conviction, basada, that sense of confidence. Get them all working together on this path. And you find that they develop the mind and the heart in ways that make a radical difference in both. If you're working on only one side, the difference is not all that radical. It touches only part of you. What you want is something that you can really give your whole life to because it transforms your whole heart and mind and leads to a happiness that isn't even li limited by that conjunction of heart and mind. It's even bigger than that. So as we work on the technicalities of meditation, always try to keep the larger picture in mind. And when you sense the importance of the larger picture, realize that a lot of it has been the solution to the, the problem of Sungwega, the problem of aging, illness, and death, lies in being very, very careful about how you approach the present moment. So that larger picture doesn't blur off into vagueness, and the technicalities don't become ritualistic. This is how you keep your whole practice in perspective and how that larger perspective keeps your practice on course.